While the Mongols were famous for their ultimatums of destruction and submission, as the 13th century went on and the dream of Chinggisid world hegemony seemed ever further away, the Mongol Khans began to seek not the capitulation but the cooperation of Western Europe. For the Ilkhanate's 60-year struggle against the Mamluk Sultanate, the Ilkhans sought to bring the popes and monarchs of Europe to a new crusade to assist in the defeat of the Mamluks. The first Mongol messages to the kings of Europe came in the late 1230s and 40s, accompanying Batu and Subutai's western invasion, asking the Hungarians how they possibly could hope to flee the grasp of the Mongols. Over the 1240s and 50s, European envoys to the Mongol Empire returned from Karakorum with orders for the kings and popes to come to Mongolia and submit in person. While Rus and Armenian lords and kings did do so, there is little indication that European rulers even responded to these demands. For the Mongols, who seemed poised to dominate everything under the eternal blue sky, there was little reason to adopt more conciliatory language. From their point of view, the Europeans were only stalling the inevitable. Soon, Mongol hoofbeats would certainly be heard in Paris and Rome. The rare diplomatic exception was an embassy sent to King Louis IX of France during his stay in Cyprus in 1248, before the Seventh Crusade, when messengers came from the Mongol commander in the west, El Jigide. Calling Louis son, the letter brought no demand of submission, but mentioned Mongol favoritism to Christians urged the French king not to discriminate between Latin and non-Latin Christians as all were equal under Mongol law and wished him well in his endeavours. The letter was forwarded back to France and ultimately to King Henry III of England. It has been speculated that this letter was Mongol wariness at the sudden appearance of Louis's army in Cyprus and a desire to find out his military intentions rather than any genuine interest in cooperation at this point. Ultimately it was for naught, as El Jigide was soon put to death in the political turmoil following Guyuk Khan's death in 1248, and Louis IX suffered a humiliating defeat in Egypt at Mansura, captured and ransomed by the newly emerging Mamluks. The halting of the Mongol advance at Anjalut by the Mamluks and the fracturing of the empire into independent Khanates after Great Khan Munkar's death left the new Ilkhanate in a precarious position. Surrounded by enemies on all sides, the only direction they could expand not at the expense of fellow Mongols was against the Mamluks, who fortified their shared border with the Ilkhans. Even a small raid could trigger the arrival of the full Mamluk army, a dangerous prospect against such deadly warriors. Opening a new front against the Mamluks was necessary, and there were already convenient beachheads established in the form of the remaining Crusader states. A shadow of their former selves, the Crusader states were represented by a few major coastal holdings like Antioch, Tripoli and Acre, and inland fortifications like Crac de Chevalier and Montfort, as well as the Kingdom of Cyprus, whose ruler, Hugh III, took the title King of Jerusalem in 1268. The Crusader states had shown neutrality to the Mongols, or even joined them, such as the county of Tripoli in 1260 after the Mongols entered Syria. In early 1260, the papal legate at Acre sent an embassy to Hulagu, most likely to discourage him from attacking the Crusader holdings. Along with information from the kings of Armenian Cilicia, their most important regional vassals, the Mongols would have had a vague knowledge of Western Europe and their crusading history. The Ilkhanid's founder, Hulagu, sent the first letter to the West in 1262, intended once more for King Louis IX, though this embassy was turned back in Sicily. Pope Urban IV may have learned of the attempt, and the next year sent a letter to Hulagu, apparently having been told that the Ilkhan had become a Christian. Delighted at the idea, the Pope informed Hulagu that if he was baptized, he would receive aid from the West. In reality, Hulagu never converted to Christianity and died in 1265 without sending any more letters. His son and successor, Abaka, was the Ilkhan most dedicated to establishing a Franco-Mongol alliance and came the closest to doing so. Due to conflict on his distant borders with the Golden Horde and Chagatiyids, as well as the troubles of consolidating power as a new monarch in a new realm, 
For the 1260s, he was unable to commit forces to the Mamluk frontier. As a good Mongol, Abaka was unwilling to allow the enemy total respite and made it his mission to encourage an attack from the west on the Mamluks. His first embassy was sent in 1266, contacting the Byzantines, Pope Clement IV, and King James I of Aragon, hoping for a united Christian front to combine efforts with the Mongols against the Mamluks, inquiring which route into Palestine the Christian forces would take. The responses were generally positive, Pope Clement replying that as soon as he knew which route, he would inform Abaka. Abaka sent a message again in 1268, inquiring about progress. James of Aragon found himself the most motivated by the Ilkhan's requests, encouraged by the promises of Abaka's logistical and military support once they reached the mainland. James made his preparations and launched a fleet in September 1269. An unexpected storm scattered the fleet, and only two of James's bastard children made it to Acre, who stayed only briefly, accomplishing little there. Not long after, King Louis IX set out for crusade once more, making the inexplicable choice to land in Tunis in 1270. Despite his well-planned efforts, the crusade was an utter disaster, and Louis died of dysentery outside the walls of Tunis in August 1270. Prince Edward of England with his army landed in Tunis shortly before the evacuation of the Crusaders, and disgusted by what he saw, set his fleet for the Holy Land, landing in Acre in May 1271, joined by Hugh of Lusignan, King of Cyprus. Edward's timing was good, as Abaka had returned from a great victory over the Chagatai Khan Barak at Herat in July 1270, though had suffered a major hunting accident that November. The Mamluk Sultan Baybars was campaigning in Syria in spring 1271, the famous Crack de Chevalier falling to him that April. Tripoli would have fallen next had Baybars not retreated back to Damascus, hearing of the sudden arrival of a Crusader fleet. He was wary of being caught between European heavy cavalry and Mongol horse archers. Soon after landing, Edward made his preparations for an offensive and reached out to Abeka. Abaka was delighted and sent a reply and orders for Samagar, the Mongol commander in Anatolia, to head to Syria. Edward did not wait for Abaka's reply, and there is no indication he ever responded to Abaka's letter. He set out in mid-July, ensuring his army suffered the most from the summer heat, while missing the Mongols, who preferred to campaign in the winter. Suffering high casualties and accomplishing little, he withdrew back to Acre. In mid-October, Samagar arrived with his army, raiding as far as to the west of Aleppo, while an elite force of Mongols scouted ahead, routing a large group of Turkmen between Antioch and Harim, but they were soon forced to retreat with the advance of the Mamluk army under Baybars. Missing Samagar by only a few weeks, in November, Edward marched south from Acre at the head of a column of men from England, Acre and Cyprus, with Templars, Hospitallers and Teutonic Knights. They ambushed some Turkmen on the Sharon Plain and forced the local Mamluk governor to withdraw, but with the arrival of large Mamluk reinforcements, the Crusaders fled, losing their prisoners and booty. That was the closest the Mongols and the Franks came to proper coordination. Edward helped oversee a peace treaty between the Mamluks and the Kingdom of Jerusalem, but the heat, difficulties campaigning, political infighting, and an assassination attempt on his life permanently turned him off crusading. By September 1272, Edward set sail for England. A few weeks after his departure, the Mongols again invaded, besieging Albira, but were defeated by the Mamluks in December. Edward's brief effort in Syria demonstrated the difficulties prefacing any Mongol-Frankish cooperation. The Mamluks were a cohesive, unified force, well accustomed to the environment and working from a well-supplied logistic system and intelligence network, while the Franks and Mongols were unable to ever develop a proper timetable for operations together. The European arrivals generally had unrealistic goals for their campaigns, bringing neither the men, resources or experience to make an impact. Abaka continued to organize further efforts and found many willing ears at the Second Council of Lyon in France in 1274. 
a meeting of the great powers of Christendom intended to settle doctrinal issues, the division of the Catholic and Orthodox churches, and plan the reconquest of the Holy Land. Abaka's delegation informed the council that the Ilkhan had secured his borders and could now bring his full might against the Mamluks, and urged the Christian powers to do likewise. The current Pope, Gregory X, fully supported this and made efforts to set things in motion, but his death in 1276 killed whatever momentum this process had had. Abaka sent another round of envoys, who reached the kings of France and the new King of England, Edward. The envoys brought the Ilkhan's apologies for failing to cooperate properly during Edward's crusade and asked him to return. Edward politely declined. This was the final set of envoys Abaka sent west before his death in 1282, and his successors found no more luck than he had. The most interesting envoy to bring the tidings of the Ilkhan to Europe did not originate in the Ilkhanate, but in China. Rabin Basoma, born in 1220 in what is now modern-day Beijing, was a Turkic Nestorian priest who had set out on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem before being conscripted to act as a messenger for the Ilkhan, in a journey which is a fascinating contrast to that of his contemporary Marco Polo. Writing his accounts down upon his return to Baghdad later in life, he described how he brought messages and gifts to the Byzantine Emperor Andronikos II Palaiologos, marveled at the Hagia Sophia, then landed in Sicily and made his way to Rome, having just missed the death of Pope Honorius IV. Travelling on to France, he was warmly welcomed by King Philip IV, and then on to Gascony, where he met the campaigning King Edward of England, who again responded kindly to the Ilkhan's envoy. On his return journey, he met the new Pope Nicholas IV in 1288, before returning to the Ilkhanate. Despite the generous receptions he was given by the heads of Europe, and despite the Ilkhan's promises to return Jerusalem to Christian hands, the reality was there was no ruler in the West interested or capable of going on crusade. By now, the act of crusading in the Holy Land had lost its luster. The final crusades, almost all disasters and costly ones at that. With the final crusader strongholds falling to the Mamluks in the early 1290s, there was no longer even a proper beachhead on the coast for a crusading army. The sheer distance and cost of going on crusade especially with numerous ongoing issues in their own kingdoms at hand, outweighed whatever perceived benefit there might have been in doing so. In contrast, the Mamluks had somewhat greater success in their own overseas diplomacy. Baybars initiated contact with the Golden Horde, ruled by the Muslim Burqa Khan, encouraging him to attack his cousins in the Ilkhanate. Sultan Baybars also kept good relations with the Byzantine Empire and the Genoese, allowing him to keep the flow of Turkic slave soldiers from the steps of the Golden Horde open, the keystone of the Mamluk military. There is, al <coughs> there is also evidence they undertook some limited diplomacy with Kaidu Khan during the height of his rule over Central Asia and the Chagatids. While the Mamluks and Golden Horde never undertook any true military cooperation, the continuation of their talks kept the Ilkhanate wary of enemies on all borders never truly able to bring the entirety of its considerable might against one foe, lest another strike the Ilkhan's exposed frontiers. Ilkhanid European contacts continued into the 14th century, but with somewhat less regularity after Rabin Barsoma's journey. An archbishopric was even founded in the new Ilkhanid capital of Sultania in 1318 and papal envoys would travel through the Ilkhanate to the Yuan dynasty in China until the late 1330s. Ilkhan Abu Sa'id organized a peace with the Mamluks in the 1320s, and the disintegration of the Ilkhanate after his death in 1335 put an end to this fascinating period of European-Mongol contact, as well as putting an almost total end to European interest and contacts with the Middle East for the next five centuries. More videos on Mongol history are on their way, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise 
via the link in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.